we've allowed the cancer of relativism to infect us, so we think there are no shared universal values, and there is no freedom without those shared universals. Het feit is iets wat je niet kan waarderen wanneer je het helemaal hebt. Je moet het een tijdje niet hebben en dan pas begrijp je wat je mist. Reverse the question. Can art destroy the world? And I think it can. You can choose either to be abused or not. The political news is robust. The safety of journalists. We hacked into the audience and then all of a sudden 300 phones would ring, you know. Président. Le président de tout le peuple de France, le président des patriotes face à la menace des nationalistes. C'est un, un Kennedy français, il est imaginatif, il est moderne. Moi, ça fait depuis 88 que je vote et je n'ai jamais vu un tel phénomène. Et on est dans une époque sinistre et cynique. Et lui n'est jamais cynique. Ce résultat est historique. Il fait reposer sur moi désormais la responsabilité immense de la défense de la nation française, de son unité, de sa sécurité, de sa culture de sa prospérité et de son indépendance. On a deux semaines pour convaincre les Français, et je pense qu'il y aura un sursaut patriotique. Les Français ne veulent pas de ce mondialisme, les Français sont profondément attachés à leur nation, et on va gagner. Yeah, goedenavond, good evening everybody. Um, welcome in Bali. Um, Le Pen or Macron, that's going to be the question over five days. And um, I'm really happy that you're all here, because it proves that you understood how important these elections are to give up your free nights to come to the Bali to talk about them. Um, my name is Tim Aagemakers, I'm program editor at the Bali. And um, we wanted to organize this event tonight after an event we've done a month ago, where we talked about the French elections just before the first round. And what we noticed was that people, um, well, were dealing with the same emotions maybe that we had with the Trump election, that we had with the Dutch election, what route are we going to take? Are we going to the right? Are we going to the left? Well, in France, not anymore to the left because, well, they lost quite big in the, in the first round. But still, what route are we going to take and why is it important to us? Um, tonight we're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about that with um, Renaud Girard. And um, I'm really happy that he's here. Unfortunately, it's not in French, Renaud. We're going to do it in English. Um, but I already saw and heard that he's quite capable of doing that, which is also e every time really nice if we have a French person over who can actually speak really good English. So thank you, Renaud, for that. B yeah, sorry for that, but sometimes it, uh, it kind of drags along. You, you don't recognize that, maybe? Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, depends. it depends, yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, we have Renaud. We're really happy that you're here. Um, Renaud is one of the most interesting journalists of France. He works for Le, Le Figaro. He's been working there for 30 years, um, and he has written this book, Les Mans, Quelle Diplomatie pour la France, uh, and it's really concise, H how did you call it, it's, it's like a small Bible to keep in your pocket for the next leaders of French about how they should deal with foreign politics um, and with diplomacy. And every Tuesday he writes his column on foreign affairs in Le Figaro, the newspaper you're probably all aware of. Um, I'm going to introduce him later a bit more. But first, we've asked Elske Schouten, she is head of the foreign desk of NRC Handelsblad, the Dutch Daily, to give us a bit of an insight into why these elections matter to us. I mean, it's in France, and well, Elske and I, we were discussing at dinner how actually in the Netherlands people are not really 
Um, I mean, if, if you organize a night about Trump, it's going to be a full audience. If you organize a night about the Brexit, many people are going to be there, but maybe the, fr the French elections are equally important to us. Um, Elske Schouten will explain us why. Give her a warm round of applause. Elske Schouten. Hi, good evening, everybody. And Tim, thanks for inviting me. You um, uh, invited me after I tweeted that these were by far the most important elections this year. And um, I must say that it does uh, look a little less dramatic than it did uh, before the first round. But I still... Uh, uh, think that is the case, that this is the, really the most, by far the most important election this year. I'm going to talk, uh, you asked me to, to write a column uh, about why these elections matter to the Netherlands. So I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about the dangers of a Macron presidency for the Netherlands. After the victory of Emmanuel Macron in the first round, there were jubilant reactions in Brussels and Berlin. Of course I'm happy, said the German Minister of Foreign Affairs. I'm sure he will be president. Mogherini from the European Union called him the hope and future of our generation. No such hallelujah from the Dutch government. The most enthusiastic reaction I saw from a party leader was from Geert Wilders, who congratulated Le Pen. <laughs> of course, Mark Rutte might just want to wait until the second round. After all, we can still end up with Le Pen, although her chances look slim. And we Dutch people are not so exuberant, after all. We will easily say something like, well, uh, laat hem eerst nou maar eens winnen. <laughs> but, could there be another reason that The Hague is not cheering for the pro-European messiah yet? I think there might. Of course, it looks very good. Optimism has trumped populism in the first round. Enthusiastic young Frenchmen, like this lady you saw, waving with EU flags, have thus far prevailed over France's first rhetoric. But politicians, the Dutch as well, tend to think in the first place about their own re-election, and Macron can pose them with some problems. The case is that this pro-European savior happens to want reforms in the European Union that are pretty unpopular here in the Netherlands. To give a few examples, Macron is a supporter of a Eurozone budget overseen by a Eurozone parliament and a Eurozone minister of finance. This budget should be used to do investments, to supply countries in trouble with emergency funds, and to soften the effects if there is an economic crisis. In other words, more solidarity between Eurozone countries. Macron will probably also start a discussion about Eurobonds again. The idea about Eurobonds is this, that countries with weak finances, like France, or Italy, or Greece, can borrow money cheaply thanks to countries with strong finances, like Germany or the Netherlands. This is completely off limits to the Netherlands. <laughs> Another proposal of Macron is to start a defense fund to buy military equipment with all member states together. Not much enthusiasm for this plan in The Hague either. So you could say, what's the problem? France has always wanted things it didn't get in the European Union. It talks about Eurobonds for ages, but Angela Merkel keeps saying no. It might well be different this time. Because I don't believe that the European cheering for Mr. Macron after the first round was without meaning. Brussels and Berlin not only want him to win, they also really want him to succeed. Because imagine what happens if he doesn't succeed. If he turns out to be an inexperienced outsider who can't get things done, if poverty and pessimism only get worse, if the French voters see their president being pushed around by Angela Merkel, just as Marine Le Pen has predicted, and with the traditional left and right wing parties blown up by Mr. Macron himself. There is a real fear that if Mr. Macron fails to make France great again, Le Pen has very good cards in the 2022 election. Macron himself already started to use this as some kind of blackmailing strategy. Just look at the headlines we had yesterday. 
if the EU doesn't reform, France will choose Le Pen next time and there will be a Frexit, he said to the BBC. Another interesting interview was with Angela Merkel. She not only said that she hopes that he wins, she also said that she is sure that he will be a strong president. Of course, there is no other country that roots so strongly for Mr. Macron as Germany. Just look at the other French candidates in this election. Le Pen and Mélenchon are outright anti-Berlin, and together they won 40% of the votes. They both want the Frexit, which would be disastrous for the European Union and thus for Germany. Germany needs France, albeit to convince the other EU member, members that it's not planning to dominate them again. So what will happen in Berlin? First, they have elections themselves in September. There is a possibility that Mr. Schulz will become the Bundeskanzler. <laughs> he is a socialist and a Europhile who would definitely be open to some of Macron's plans. But also, if Mrs. Merkel stays in power, she might go along with some of the less outrageous French proposals. Especially if my, Mr. Macron keeps his promise to clean up his economic mess at home. Will this be in the interest of the Netherlands? Not necessarily. In general, if it's getting too chummy between France and Germany, it's never good news for the Netherlands. Or for any small member state for that matter. To make matters worse, we just lost the Brits on our side. It was not for nothing that the Netherlands were one of the strongest supporters of British EU membership in the 70s. They were our most important partner. They were a counterweight <coughs> for us to France and Germany. So, back to our politicians in The Hague. Of course, I believe that Mark Rutte will strongly root for Mr. Macron next Sunday. A Le Pen presidency would be a disaster for the Netherlands. It can also turn out positive if there is less stagnation in Europe and more good news from the EU. But I think Mark Rutte might also foresee some difficult discussions in Brussels. The French jigsaw is pretty complicated if seen from The Hague. Imagine that the Macron presidency will be a huge success and that he manages to reform his own country and that he can ram through some French uh, hobbies in Brussels, like more European solidarity or the start of a European army. In that case, Mr. Macron might fend off a challenge of Le Pen in 2022 easily. But Mark, Mr. Rutte will have to explain that here. And will Dutch voters like it if the European Union becomes more powerful, if it becomes bigger, if it becomes more French? I can imagine that Mr. Mark Rutte might be a bit worried about fending off his own populist anti-European challenge here at home. Thank you. Um, <laughs> just, just if you just stay there, just one question. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Did you see yesterday, it was in the news, that Macron was taking a, taking a different stance on Europe. He was getting tough on Europe. Did you see that? Well, yeah, How can you explain I, um, that? Well, this is the interview in the BBC I was mentioning. He, he, it, it was not that he uh, said that I, he suddenly wanted to Frexit or something. What he said is that um, if he doesn't get his way in Brussels, so if the European Union will not reform uh, in the way he wants yeah. it, so like uh, a more European solidarity, for example, then he says, my presidency will not be a success, the French will uh, vote for Le Pen next time, and then you will ah, face a Frexit. So he's not saying that his position, but he was no, showing no, the no, effects no. of what's He doesn't there. want to Frexit. The guy is a total Europhile. Yeah, then yes. we have his position clear. Yeah. Thanks again, <laughs> take a seat, and we're going to come back to you afterwards to see how you respond to our conversation, maybe. Sure. Thank you. Elske Schout, to give her a warm hand. Um, we've now seen already, we, we, we've taken a bit of a leap when Macron is president, but let's not get ahead of ourselves and we're going to uh, dive into what's been happening uh, up until now. Um, so please, I want to invite, I've already introduced him, but I will do so once more. He works for the Figaro, where he writes about European politics and foreign affairs. Uh, he came to Amsterdam especially to tell us a little bit more about how he sees things in France and why they matter to us. Um, give him a warm hand. Renaud Girard. Uh, 
Um, I have to tell you that I'm so happy that uh, to be here in such a beautiful city. When I arrived, the sun started to shine, and um, and I had a wonderful walk and a wonderful uh, visit of this exhibition of um, <laughs> what is it called? The style. The style. The style. The style. And I discovered a Dutch painter that I didn't know, Chris Beckman. Yeah, Beckman, wh wh whom I think is a great painter. So um, I'm very <laughs> Take happy note. to be yeah. here. Yeah, and uh, of course ready to answer to you all your questions. I'm sorry, um, I don't speak good English. I will try. <laughs> to do my best, but uh, we're not like the Dutch. A lot of things have changed in this country because I remember when I came here first in 1960, I was a boy, and my uh, jeune fille au pair invited me to La Hague. And I was, um, I was playing in the streets, and everybody would speak French at the time. So I didn't, I didn't figure out that I was in a foreign country. <laughs> but it's a stick. It, it was the old bourgeoisie of La Hague yeah. who was like speaking, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> speaking French. <laughs> Shall we turn to France and the, uh, and the elections before we get into the uh, style uh, really close? Um, before we turn to a more thorough analysis of the election, let's just start with a real general question. It's now five days before the second round of the election. What is the, um, the well? What's the latest update you can give us so far? I mean, Macron and Le Pen are campaigning. So I took this, uh, this is my newspaper, uh, Le Figaro, so it's a morning newspaper. And they say, second tour, Macron fait la course en tête. For the second round, Macron is um, driving or running ahead. And um, <coughs> Le Figaro made a, a poll. Gallup poll, and uh, apparently the leader of En Marche, because you have seen that his, his <coughs> movement has the same initials as his name. It's not E.M., En Marche, walking. E.M., Emmanuel Macron, the same. Some say that it's a little bit narcissistic. But, you know. And 59% and, uh, and uh, 59% and 41% for Marine Le Pen. It happens that uh, polls in France for the first round were quite accurate. So if you listen to Elska's column, she's right in addressing President Macron already, according to you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, uh, of course, there will be a big event, which is the debate, the TV debate in, um, uh, in on, on Wednesday night. There's a big change, actually, because uh, last time that uh, Front National was in the second one, it was uh, in uh, 2002. With her father, it was? I think With her Le father, yeah. yes, Jean-Marie Le Pen. And Chirac was the president. His prime minister, socialist prime minister, was beaten in the first one by, by uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen. So you had a second one. But Chirac did not accept to have a debate with uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen. Today, it would not have been accepted, I think, by the electorate that Macron uh, refuses a debate with uh, Marine Le Pen. And of course, what will be important is the figure. If she has less than 40 percent. You can imagine that, of course, she will be very uh, important in French politics. We have uh, parliamentary elections in, uh, in, uh, in June. In June. Um, but the normal right will still have hope. Uh, if she scores 45, 46 percent, I mean, she will be actually the main opposition leader yeah. 
to uh, Macron. Macron is hoping to stay in power for 10 years because now I think the French constitution, you cannot r run for more than two, mm -hmm. uh, two mandates in a row. Um, uh, but, okay, we'll see. So, so, so you mean that, just to clarify, if, if she gets 45, 46% in the parliamentary election, she will also score really good and be the main opposition it leader, or do you mean outside of parliament? We will have, we will have a campaign. I mean, French politics, are, French politics are totally unpredictable. You understand that everybody, nobody one year ago could have said, okay, the two main parties that have run France for the last 30 years would be eliminated yeah. to the main, from the main electoral contest in France. And they have been eliminated. I mean, the Socialist Party is almost dead. I mean, yeah. uh, was six, six. Uh, and the two parties we have imported from America this uh, primary, okay? Because um, French like to import things from America and think that America is more modern and so on. So they they do import uh, quite a lot, of, quite a lot of things, and they import in the primaries, and. Um, and um, you saw the results. I mean, none of <laughs> the two selected by the primaries were allowed to, uh, yeah. to run in the in the second round. So uh, it's a it's it, it, it's a big change. But of course, if she gets forty five percent, she will be uh, she will be the main. Uh, do you hear better? Is it better now? She she will be the main the main opposition figure, if you like. Yeah. And, and uh, how do you see the election as in, what are for you, if, if, if you watch at the elections now, what are the divisions? What are the main themes that it is, that it is centered around the discussions? I mean, it's very simple, it's very simple. Um, you have, it, it was said in this, you have people who are in favor of Europe, of globalization, and people were against it. And in France, it's 50-50. Mm -hmm. And the uh, electoral map is that uh, all the cities, or all the departements, you know, the French is divided, in France is divided in 95 departments, districts, if you like, um, that uh, have a low rate of unemployment that you know belong to the global the globalized world yeah. and so on uh, they vote for either center right or center left or whatever uh, for these pro european uh, parties yeah all the deindustrialized um, uh, department districts you don't have that in in uh, in your country because uh, Holland is very well integrated in the globalized well, world. We might saw it a little bit, but you can see that in Belgium, for instance, you know, mm. the south of Belgium and so on. You have like you have like in uh, in France, you have like um, industrial wrecks, if you like, um, because because of uh, globalization of the Chinese, you know, competition yeah. and so on. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, factories have to close, and uh, and there was a controversy. They went to uh, to visit it, both of them, uh, Macron and Le Pen, a whirlpool factory in the north of France, that the um, workers are going are going to be fired because the factory is going to be moved to Poland, where salaries are probably three times less as in yeah. France. So, um, and so Le Pen was cheered on there, right? Yeah, yeah, By yeah, the workers, yeah, yeah. yeah. But Macron went also, he was quite courageous, and he stayed until the end. Um, so, um, he, uh, he, he, he showed like courage to go and speak to the workers. And of course, uh, Macron uh, was a banker with Rothschild, you know, making big deals between Nestle and Pfizer you know, world deals and so on, making a lot of money um, with these deals. I mean, um, you know, uh, 
investment banker, and um, and so um, uh, he's he's seen or he's attacked by Marine Le Pen as somebody who is not not concerned with uh, the real people, the people who are suffering from globalization. The half of France. Uh, and is she right about that, according to you? What? We, half of French voters think that they, have, they are forgotten by le système, the system. Yeah. The system is, uh, you know, um, the, the system, the Brussels system, the European system that uh, allows free uh, trade and so on. So this is the main, the main division. The main division is that um, Le Pen and Mélenchon, the two main you know, anti-European parties, yeah, Mélenchon, on the left. Mélenchon from the left, Le Pen from the right, they are anti-globalization. Uh, um, they, they are there to protect the unemployed, to uh, keep the social rights of the French workers. Yeah. And it's interesting because France is a country where the Communist Party was very strong. In the, um, in the 70s, the Communist Party was rating over 20% in France. And then a lot of Communist Party members, or voters, went to Front National because they were representing, they were, the Front National were defending the workers, the French workers, attacking the patronat, how do you say patronat, the... Um, Employers. Employers. Yeah. Attacking the employees. Oh, yes. You, uh, you ask for immigrants because you can pay them less. Yeah. You know? And, um, and what is interesting is that Mélenchon, who is a very, very good uh, orator, like Marine, she's a very good orator. Uh, I don't know if you understood what she said, but she speaks quite well. Uh, like Mélenchon also. They are very good uh, speakers, yeah. if you like. And Mélenchon took back some votes uh, from, uh, from Le Front National. Yeah. Uh, because everybody said that, oh, Marine Le Pen, she will score 25 or 26 or 30 percent. She did not. She scored 21.5, yeah. which is not very much more than what her father scored in uh, two, uh, uh, 2002 because I think he got something like 18% yeah. yeah. and he but, was elected. But then I want to show you because we have, um, I mean, you, you describe quite eloquently how, for example, the people who first voted communist went to full national. But if you look at the polls, and we have the graphic of it, among young people, uh, uh, Mélenchon and Le Pen were the most popular, were 50% voted for them. Yeah. You can see yeah. it here. Huh? You see the... Uh, among 18 to 24, Mélenchon is red 30 percent, and then you have Le Pen in brown 21 percent. That's more than half of the young people. Yes, 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 yes. How, yes. how do you explain that, that they vote for this, as you call, anti-globalization -glo parties? Is it because of the globalization um, argument, or, is it, or how do you explain that? Okay, you have several things with young people. You have... You can all see it there. Yeah, yeah you, you, you have, like... Um, you have several, uh, several um, uh, phenomena. Of course, unemployment. The unemployment is high in France. It's like 10%. It's something we don't know in your country. Um, and probably for the young people, it can go up to, I don't know, 25. 15, 20, 25 yeah. percent. So uh, this is one fact. The uh, only um, identity factor, you know, uh, Islam, okay, and uh, people, uh, a lot of young people do not, do not uh, accept, for instance, uh, women wearing scarves or things like that, and uh, and of course you had um, this huge uh, terrorist attacks in France. Uh, you did have some terrorist attacks in the Netherlands, but in France, I mean, uh, in Nice, and uh, you have yeah. like. Very big terrorist attack. I mean, 130 young people killed in a in a theater, you know, in a, the Bataclan. So, um, so this this of course played a role, 
um, and also um, 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 a lot of I mean you know uh, in France you had always had a, a, a quite strong left it used to be even stronger but you still have a, 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 I mean from French you know revolution you have a strong le left in France yeah. it's not the majority of the country France is not anymore it's the one of the only socialist country in the world okay with the Cuba and uh, North Korea and, and so on but but um, it's much more socialist than uh, than the Netherlands who had a lot of um, uh, social uh, de uh, Democrats in power um, for America I mean Juppé program the right-wing program would be Bernie Sanders okay yeah. even Bernie Sanders does not does not uh, ask for free uh, university education but for French people the fact that uh, uh, university education is free is totally normal yeah. uh, so no, nobody would change that I mean, you know, it's, it's a socialist country and um, uh, so uh, so, so this is so but but the, the French voters are now much more right wing than they were because if you see the, the if you see the the previous chart you see that who is really leftist in France twenty eight percent of the electorate you have like uh, nineteen for Mélenchon yeah. six for for Amon so it's twenty five one or two Trotskists, two percent of the Trotskists, get okay, twenty-seven billion. Yeah, but but that's a European phenomenon also. That's not only in France, I think. If you look at the Dutch elections, if you look at oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Italy, we don't know. Yeah, but uh, it's true that Italy. Yes, it's it, you are right because in Italy, uh, Renzi is quite center. Renzi, yeah. Renzi thinks that he is a Macron or will campaign saying that he's a Macron. It's what he said. So, so let's dive a bit more into Macron because we have a short clip which explains a bit more about his program and what, what he wants. I think we have it on the video. Emmanuel Macron is not your typical candidate. He's young, never been elected to any office and is standing without the backing of any of France's main parties. So just how does he hope to become the next president? Easy. Dismiss left and right, create an independent party and head straight down the center. At 39, Emmanuel Macron has worked as a banker and as a civil servant before becoming an aide to François Hollande in 2012. Just two years later, he was appointed France's economy minister, but resigned in 2016 after struggling to push labor reforms through parliament. By November, he announced that he was making a run for the French presidency. Politics aside, Emmanuel Macron is married to Brigitte Trogneux, who is 24 years his senior. He claims to represent a third way. Those on the right like him for his economic liberalism, his promise to increase defense spending, and to make fighting Islamic fundamentalism a priority. Those on the left like his social liberalism and his promise to hike the pay and cut the red tape for teachers working in deprived neighborhoods. But in a campaign that has seen the traditional right and left move further apart, Emmanuel Macron's centrism is proving popular and could yet be the winning position. So, so we've actually sort of analyzed that there are several aspects in the French elections. You have this security crisis, which you described with all the attacks. You, ha you also said with youngsters there's this question of identity and then you have this economic aspect with the high uh, youth unemployment. Um, the one thing we haven't tackled that much is the plan of Macron for, I mean, the one thing I always learned from Francis, you can say a lot about them, but they never reform. Economically, they never reform. And it might be a caricature, but is it true? And what's he going to do about that? What's his plan for the economy? Actually, he... The one who really had a program, a written program, very strict, to reform was Fillon. Uh, Macron was, like this lady said, more a Kennedy Francais. I mean, we all love each other. I love you. I love you. We should unite. Uh, 
Let's make France beautiful again. Um, I love you. Let's love each other. Um, and it's it's more it's more uh, his program is not he doesn't have a, I, I I cannot tell you. Nobody can tell you what is really is. Well, okay, he has some one demagogic measure which is to 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 erase uh, city tax for 90 percent. I don't. Nobody knows how he will f finance that. But this is not important because he understood that the presidential election is the encounter, the meeting between a man and a nation. He got that. And um, he got also, when, where is really brilliant is that people think is anti-system, though it's totally made by the system. Yeah. He went to the Ecole Nationale d'Administration, where all the leaders came, come from this school and so on. He worked in l'inspection des finances, you do, which is the, the best part of the public service or whatever. He was a banker for Rothschild, but still, is not in the system. He was a minister, he, he worked at the Elysee, he was a minister, but still, is not the system. So how does he do that? Because he, he, he stepped away and he said, I want to do de la politique autrement. I want to do politics in another matter. Yeah. I don't want, he, he does not, he's quite, he does not attack his adversaries too much, you know, is is. Is polite. Is uh, he says uh, we have to unite. Uh, politics is not civil war, if you like. And um, and on top of that, it's true that people feel that is he knows the subjects. Um, he is he was a very good student in uh, you know in the uh, French system for. For in, in this school for civil servants. And, and, and you met him, right? Yes, a few yes. Times. How, how would you describe his persona then? If He's not arrogant. Is uh, very simple, very polite. Uh, he looks at you in the eyes when he speaks to you, as if you were unique, um, and is quite knowledgeable. He knows things. You know he. Probably he sleeps uh, not much, he reads a lot. And also, he was chosen in two, 2007, when Sarkozy came to power. He was supposed to make all these reforms. Um, he had a good idea. He appointed a um, commission, which is called La Commission Atali, uh, 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 you know, this kind of think tank or commission, to, um, to study what kind of reform should be done in France. And he appointed a former advisor of Mitterrand to to preside it, you know. And um, and one of the help or the main helper of Attali was this young guy, Emmanuel Macron. So he knows all the problem of France uh, because he worked on them. And unfortunately, uh, this commission gave a big report. Uh, to uh, President uh, Sarkozy, but as it often happens in France, the report was put on the shelf, and uh, it did not. Uh, no reforms were made. The last time that uh, that reports were taken out from the shelves to be really done is when De Gaulle came back to power in May 1958. He had he asked special powers to the Parliament. And then he made all the reforms. He took all the reports from the shelves, and he did it. He ruled by ordinance, would say, even not going for, to the or going to the parliament, but only at the end in a kind of global uh, global thing, and in a pack, if you like. It's called uh, uh, légiféré par ordonnance. It's uh, special to the French constitution. And um, it worked quite well. I mean, he reformed all French system. Um, the, the franc became a very strong currency and so on. 
and um, but it, it was the last last time that it was done. So nobody knows if um, if Macron uh, will be will really reform the country. He has the knowledge. He has the energy. He's an entrepreneur because you know when he started. Everybody said, oh, it's just a bubble. Mm. We had several of these politicians in the 60s and 70s that, oh, we are not, send, we are not from the left and from the right side. But he made it. So, uh, so. Uh, uh, you might give him a chance in pursuing yeah, it. And, and I agree that what he said to the BBC that he has to reform <coughs> Europe. Because Europe has to be reformed. I mean, um, Europe in uh, March uh, 2000, there were the agenda of Lisbon. And there was a summit. And they said, we are going to build the um, uh, l'économie de la connaissance, the new knowledge economy. Like, yeah. we are going to be a big California. Okay? It was, you know, in a summit in Lisbon. This is called uh, the, the Lisbon strategy. It was never applied. In 2008, there was a huge crisis which came from the United States of America. Europe had no responsibility in that. French banks, German banks, Dutch banks, no responsibility at all in, in that because subprimes do not exist in our countries. But then this huge crisis affected us, affected all Europe. We didn't have one European leader to explain us, okay, what it is, what I will do to fight it, what will be the consequences for you. No. We had a very mediocre president of the commission called Barroso, and we knew he was mediocre, but still, Okay, you did five years as very mediocre. We are going to point you to give you five more years. So Macron is attacking that, what you're describing now? Yeah. That analysis. Uh, no, and he is also uh, thinking that, um, and this is quite true, that Europe, why Europe? Why you, what is the Eurozone? Is it an economical question, problem, or is it political? Of course it is political. Why the Germans should, should, should drop, should drop the, um, the, uh, the mark? It's political, of course. And, and all, uni uh, all monetary unions are political. Do you think that in the United States of America, where you have a, a monetary union, do you think that New York State doesn't help Missouri? Of course it helps Missouri, okay? It's the way it works, okay? And, um, and uh, of course, Macron uh, thinks that um, Germany got a lot from the, from the euro. You say, OK, Germany helped Greece a lot. But did you go to Athens? Did you see how many German cars there are in Athens? So with what money they bought these cars, OK? And um, so this is, this is um, something that he will try to, to, um, to insist on. Yeah. And he will try also to say that there is no Eurozone possible if you don't have fiscal harmony. That's bad for the Dutch because, you know, they are like a um, fiscal evasion even <laughs> uh, for the companies. Um, uh, Social, uh, social uh, uh, harmony and and budgetary, budgetary harmony. So this is this is really the main the main thing, and it's why he says he wants to reform Europe. There's something else who doesn't work in in, in, in Europe, the European Parliament. That's nobody also what knows Macron who. No, yeah, it, nobody knows. Nobody feels represented by this Parliament. Nobody knows who. I don't know who is my, my MP in the European Parliament. But, 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 but what do you think Macron defends then? Because you just said you have Europe which can be either a political or economic. Mm. But what he's maybe protecting are values. 
more. Which I mean, means, yeah. if you say he attacks the European Parliament, if you say he thinks that um, uh, Barroso and, and all the, the w way they treated the crisis was wrong, what makes him then the Europhile? Is that the values that they're... No, you, want, you want a more efficient Europe, a Europe that can say, for instance, more powerful, more united, that can say to the United States, I am sorry, your laws do not apply to the European territory. Yeah. There is a French bank called BNP who had a fine of $9 billion because it helped Iran, Cuba, and Sudan to export petrol for Iran and, uh, and, Su and Sudan and uh, cigars for Cuba. Yeah. They financed it. And they were given a fine of $9 billion because uh, they did not apply by the American law which forbids to make, uh, what at the time for, forbade, to make business with Cuba, Sudan, and Iran. But European law or French law does not. Yeah. Nine millions, nine billion dollars of fine he had to pay. If I had been the president of a strong a commission of a strong Europe, um, I would have asked the CEO of Goldman Sachs and say, please come to see me. I have a little problem with you, sir, because um, you help a member state to fraud on its uh, public accounts, you know? Uh, Greece, yeah. it helps, uh, Goldman Sachs help. It's a huge fraud, I mean, it's very serious fraud, you know? If you help a government to, to, uh, to fraud, to... Yeah. So it shows the, the, yeah. the they're to, not quite uh, potent. Uh, yeah, and uh, I would have said, okay, uh, you will have a small <laughs> fine of twenty-seven billion dollars. If you don't want to pay it, no problem. But you will be forbidden to uh, to exert your activity in the European Union and all the banks corresponding with you in the USA. Yeah. Shall we turn um, a bit more also to the other candidate now? Because we also have a short clip of Le Pen and her program. Um, maybe we can start that. She's blonde, blunt, and believes the time has come for her own brand of nationalistic populism to reign in France. So who is Marine Le Pen? This is what you need to know about her. She became head of the far-right National Front Party in 2011. She took over from her father, aiming to clean up the party's racist and anti-Semitic image. But Marine Le Pen was also accused of revisionism when she claimed that a 1942 roundup of some 13,000 Jews by French authorities was not the fault of France, but rather that of the collaborationist Vichy government. And immigration remains central to Marine Le Pen's program. She wants it capped to no more than 10,000 people a year and she wants their access to public services limited. Marine Le Pen is also in favor of a return to the French franc and she would hold a referendum that would open the door to a Frexit. Finally, there are the protectionist economic measures that she would introduce in order to boost France's economy. Internationally, Marine Le Pen is in favor of closer ties with Vladimir Putin and she's been criticized for taking a loan with a Russian bank. She says she was left with no choice after being turned down by French banks. Under her leadership, the National Front has grown more popular. Back in 2002, before she was the party's leader, it made it to the second round of the presidential election. But by 2012, it scored its best ever result in a national poll with nearly 18% of the vote. Marine Le Pen says that after the Brexit vote in the United Kingdom and Donald Trump's victory in the United States, her own triumph is now inevitable. So, um, this film was made a few weeks uh, before this event, and a lot has happened since then, and maybe you can help me, uh, or you can explain, she left the Front National, or at least she put down her uh, chairmanship, or chairwomanship of the Front National, and also with regard to the Frexit, or the return to the Franc, she has taken a bit of a, a milder approach. Do, do, do you, I mean, 
could you clarify for me what her position is now and, and w what she's doing in this last week? Yes, she, I think uh, she understood that a lot of uh, people were ready to follow her on the French, um, the defense of the French identity <coughs> and so on, what you heard on, on her speech, if you understood it. Um, but that nobody or less people would be ready, especially people who have like savings, who uh, would follow her on uh, her economic policy because people uh, say that okay they have you know if uh, France go back to to Frank that it would be kind of a, a catastrophe and so on so they they don't I mean I think the French electorate do not trust her to be a good economist um, the fact that um, the difference with uh, her father, when she took power, she tried what we call la dédiabolisation, the de devile because you know, uh, before Marine Le, uh, Jean, uh, Jean Marie Le Pen was the devil, you know, the devil and so on. And um, so she wanted to, to get uh, mainstream and she was asked a question on the um, Nazi camps and she answered very, very, you know, right away. She said, yes, everybody knows that it was a summum of barbarism and there is no matter about that. So she, you know, when her father, I mean, her father uh, sabotaged his political career when he said in a, in a radio interview in the 80s, in 86, I think, that he was, he was, he was asked, because there were some pseudo pseudo historians who said that gas chambers did not exist. Of course, everybody knows that gas chambers did exist and so on. Uh, but um, so he didn't, instead of saying just simply, yes, gas chambers have uh, existed and it's a shame, he said that he was not an historian and it was a detail of the Second World War. So it's l'affaire du détail. So with this quote, he he was you know rising like that. He killed. He he, he shot himself in the foot. Uh, Marine Le Pen de-diabolized, and uh, it's quite interesting that in the first in this in, in a speech that you saw, she quoted uh, Charles de Gaulle, General de Gaulle. And you have to remember that the friends of his father, Le Pen was a lieutenant in Algeria in, uh, in the war. Uh, the friends of his father, from a kind of uh, anti-independence of Algeria movement, <coughs> tried seven times to kill General de Gaulle. Didn't manage, but it was very close, actually. And. Um, so, uh, so she's really trying to move more on the um, uh, on the um, uh, center. Once I had, if you want to understand her psyche, uh, once I had a conversation. I mean, the only time in my life that I met her. Uh, at the time, we thought that Alain Juppé would be the one running. Alain Juppé is like a little bit uh, old Macron. He's an uh, inspector des finances, the same thing, but older, okay. And he's an old Macron, okay. He was uh, budget mini uh, finance minister when he was young. He's an old Macron. And he's the mayor of Bordeaux, and, uh, you know, uh, he didn't win in the primary for the, for the right. And, uh, but at the time, all the press thought that Juppé would yeah. be the contender, uh, the, the next president, actually. And, um, she said, I want, for me, Juppé is a perfect adversary because I defend, I defend les communes, the, the little villages, you know, les communes, the parishes, if you like, the communes, the, that's the old France, okay? Les départements, the districts of the French, the, the France of Napoleon, of the revolution. 
and the nation. And Juppé is the one who defend not the commune, but the big agglomeration, like Le Grand Bordeaux, the big Bordeaux, or the Grand Rotterdam, or the Grand Brussels, or the Grand whatever, you know, the big, the, we call that the communauté de commune, the, the big. And he defends the, not the department, he defends the regions like uh, L'Aquitaine, like, like the Bas de Wurtemberg, like La Catalogne, like Catalonia, the, the regions. And Europe. I defend uh, les, the, les paroisses, les communes, les départements, and the nation. This is the big difference. And uh, it's, it's a way she, I, di I, didn't, I didn't have the opportunity to talk to her since then. But this is the big, the big difference. Uh, and um, we'll see what the debate will be on. But I can guess that she will attack Macron on look what you did with your globalization. How many, how many people, how many workers you left on the side. Of course you don't care because you made millions as a banker dealing with Nestle in Switzerland and, and Fitzer in Germany, whatever, uh, and so on. Uh, she, will, she, will, she will speak like that. And uh, this, is, this is the main, um, yeah. the main, the main, uh, the, the main difference. But people, um, I think, will trust Macron uh, <coughs> much more to run the economy and to run, to run an economy um, that is with a huge debt. Yeah. I mean, a huge debt compared not to Italy, but compared to your debt, um, or compared to German debt. Yeah. Not compared to British to English debt, because n nobody speaks of that. But the Brits have a huge debt also. Yeah. But but okay. two more questions before we go to the audience. Um, we had Christophe de Voogd a month ago, and he said, uh, I can paint you the route to Marine Le Pen's presidency. Um, um, after the first round, Macron, everyone will, uh, he will be the target of everyone. Um, <coughs> Mélenchon and the other parties, or, or, or Mélenchon didn't root for Macron. Then there are the people who don't trust the political system, they don't want to vote for a racist, as they perceive it, but they also want, don't want to vote for the establishment, so they don't go voting. Do you see that element of the, um, um, the electorate of Le Pen being a bit more loyal to her than maybe other people to the person they vote for? M that maybe because of the abstentions, uh, Le Pen... No, she, has, she has a lot of loyal people to her, but you have seen the result, 21.5. This is yeah. a so fact. When everybody said, oh, she will go up to 30. No. So what would you say to your friend Christophe and de Vogt then? Yeah. No, I, 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 will, I, will, I will tell him that if Macron, to reform France, you need to be very tough. Very tough. You need like, to be a Thatcher. Very tough. We don't know if he, if, if if he, he has got this character, yeah. okay? Because it's very easy to say, oh, let's like each other, I love yeah, you, yeah, yeah, sure. all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And then you say, I, I will cut your social uh, security by two, you know? And yeah. It's different, okay? And um, so um, if he doesn't manage to reform for us, to show that really he does something, for education also, yeah. and, um, and uh, for security, education. Um, um, if he doesn't succeed, then? I mean, you know, if you travel, I, I was traveling recently back from Russia. I stopped in Zurich airport, and then I went to Wasi. I mean, Wasi looks a little bit like a third world country compared to Zurich. I mean, said, we said, well, what happened to France? I mean, mm -hmm. why we are not able to have a clean airport? And some kind of, of of metal working, you know, well, and um, so uh, if he does not, if he's not tough, if he's soft, mm -hmm. 
if is uh, what we call a bisou nurse, uh, like a knave, yeah. okay, she has a chance to win. In the next. In the next one. Yeah, yeah. But she, if she starts like a reformer, like I would say a leftist uh, Margaret Thatcher, he can, he can be, he can be, uh, he, he can stay for ten years, and he can be, he can enter history as the reformer of France. We don't know. We have no idea, no idea at all. Yeah, but we can talk about it. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but I, I cannot predict you anything. This is what is fascinating with French politics now. Yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, there will be a uh, microphone coming to you. If there is one. Uh, I will follow your words <coughs> about the reforms. If Macron wants to take reform measures, and you say it's not known, and it's the biggest problem in France, is that possible in general in France with your unions always against, with all people on the street always against? So actually, what were he saying? Two things. C can he be a uh, counterweight against the unions, against all those forces to push no, to reform? In France, yeah. It's all problems for Sarkozy, Chirac, yeah. Hollande to take reform measures. I think it's impossible without the crisis of 64. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, but now people actually, uh, the governments, the last president who had really a vision in France was actually Charles de Gaulle and maybe Pompidou. But then the problem that, you know, Germany had quite, not always good, but quite good chancellors. I mean, Willy Braun was a good chancellor, Albu Kohl, yes, also. Uh, several quite good chancellors. I mean, the problem with the kings of France is that you had a, a, a brilliant, brilliant king, okay? Brilliant, Charles de Gaulle, who was even smarter than Spark, your prime minister. Spark said, oh, we have to take the British, we have to take the British, I will veto all, all decisions, you remember? And, 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 and Saint Pompidou said, okay, let's take the British. Huge mistake. De Gaulle saw it. The British will never play the, by the rules. And, uh, but then, we had Giscard, who was, was a little bit a demagogue. And then we had Mitterrand, who was a little bit a, a désinvolte. Mitterrand, okay, I will be interested only in very big issues. Like, yes, I have to help the Germans uh, with, with the crisis of the SS-20. You remember when the Soviets wanted to put some, some missiles, some uh, medium, medium range missiles called SS-20. He supported Kohl and the Americans helping the, the German, the German uh, uh, government with their own cruise missiles. Uh, but, but he would not be interested in the, the management of the states. You know, it's boring to just yeah. take care of social security and so on. And Macron? Then, then no, this, this, is, this was Mitterrand. Yeah. Then you are. <laughs> <laughs> then we are around. Uh, yeah. Then we are Chirac. <laughs> Who was Chirac? We, we had in the medieval time what we call lazy king. He was a lazy king, doing nothing. Uh, then we had, uh, after Chirac, we had um, uh, Sarkozy. Uh, we call him caractériel, with a strange character, you know. And, and Holland, nice guy, in, incapable of taking a decision. So, after having, like, for 30 years, very bad kings, you know, the state of the, uh, of the nation is not that good. I mean, no private companies would have survived with, with such uh, CEOs. So this is, this, is a real, this is a real problem. The, the unions in France are very, are 
very, uh, they are really a minority. They maybe they represent 11% of the workers. But the governments are scared because they don't want problems. They don't have character. We need, people want the, somebody with character. De Gaulle has character. They, we don't have leaders with character. The Euro, yes, the problem of the Euro. What was the problem of the Euro? Why the French and the Italians decided to take the Euro? They said, okay, in monetary, okay, the French wanted to have the Union, the Euro, Mitterrand wanted to have the Euro because he was scared that, you know, Germany would come like too powerful with the unification of Germany. And he wanted, okay, so yep. let's do something that really we are, we cannot have war anymore because we have the yeah. same currency. That was political. But the Italians are the one to the EU. Why? Because they said, okay, we will, we'll, we have seen that the German, they are very serious, serious with the currency. So we want to take the Euro, which is actually the Deutsche Mark, because we want, now we want to be serious but, but, with but, our currency. But <laughs> instead of being serious, taking the Euro, allowed us to be very laxist, to be the, the country of serious, uh, yeah, yeah. to be laxist, we say in, in French. Because we could, we could borrow with very uh, cheap interest rate a lot of money. France could have never borrowed mm. uh, 2,000 uh, billion euros with a franc. Yeah. You know, but, but, but if you go back to the question, then you, your short answer would be that if he's tough enough, to see that the unions are a minority, only representing if 11%. He, if he does not reform the country, if he doesn't have the guts yeah. to, you know, to crash, like, like, like Thatcher did in, yeah. in, in Britain, if he doesn't have the guts to do it, then he will fail. It. Then he will fail, then Marine will come. Yes. Yeah. Is there any other question? Um, let's go to that woman in the back. Can you hear me? Or, yeah. um, I had a small question. Um, do you think that um, anything has changed for Marine Le Pen with the announcement that if she would win, um, she would make Nicolas Dupont-Aignan uh, prime minister? And do you think that it's like, positively influenced her chances or not? So she appointed, what, what was her name again? I forgot. Okay, she's uh, Nicolas Dupont-Aignan yep. is a Gaullist who in 2005 decided to leave the Gaullist movement because um, we, yep. we did not, the French democracy did not pay any attention to uh, the referendum. The referendum said we don't want this constitution. Of, of course it was totally foolish mm -hmm. To, to put such a uh, complicated question to a referendum. But the answer from the people was no. Oh, you say no, you will still have it. <laughs> this is Europe, how, yeah. how Europe works. You, which, by the way, was the same for you. You, do, you say no, no problem. You will still have it. <laughs> okay, and but anyway. Is, uh, yeah. the, the Lisbon Treaty. So uh, uh, Dupont-Aignan left. Yeah. So he's totally anti-European. And, uh, but he was a Gaullist, and he decided, so he scored 4.7%, which is quite a lot. In the first round? Yes, probably because he got some, some voters from Fion. Yeah. And, and um, he decided uh, to, to join uh, Marine Le Pen. But there is something that we have to say on this French elections, that now nobody in France, I don't know about uh, this country, the Netherlands, but nobody in France owns votes. I don't own your soul. I mean, a lot of people who voted for Dupont-Aignan will not vote for Marine Le Pen. So she they cannot add the 4% yes, to her And a lot account. of people who, who voted for Mélenchon will decide to vote for Marine yeah. Le Pen. You, there is no leader. I mean, this is really an election where you have no, no Führer principle at all. But I mean, uh, the Führer says something, you do the, I mean, you don't But you if don't I care. ask you a yes or no question, yeah. and you would say that 
Um, the, the, it's the, not the a big, big change. No, it's not a big it's change. It's not a big change. So no, it's, the guy, the guy scored four point seven percent. Okay, so the answer fine. No. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's do two more questions because, um, well, we take some time. The to bigger answer change, them. if you like um, to know, the bigger change yeah. is that Mélenchon. <laughs> the big change is that Mélenchon mm -hmm. did not tell at the end of the elections to vote for to vote for Macron. Macron. This is the change. Yeah. The man sitting next to the other man who are it's for the stream sorry but it, but it's already there what about <laughs> abstention abstention is about 10 percent what what about abstention do you think in the second round but where is it going to go the people who didn't vote so uh, you had a turnout of 79 se percent in the first round, which is quite high for democracy, and uh, it's the same as last time, uh, not not a big difference, maybe mm -hmm. one point less. Of course, it will be important to see if how many, uh, what kind of turnout. It's a long weekend in France; people may want to go to the countryside. Um, the they will, you will have the turnout, turn out and you will have also what we call le vote blanc. You, you can, uh, I, I guess also in the Netherlands, you can yeah. vote blank. And people want, so maybe you will have a lot of, of people who will vote blank, saying, I don't want either um, uh, Macron or uh, Le Pen. Macron has uh, a big, big, big advantage not only, of course, he has all the, uh, all the business uh, people yeah, for yeah. him, uh, all, but he has all the medias. All the medias. There is not one media, not one, not one big newspaper who is in favor of uh, Marine Le Pen. Not one radio, nothing. And, um, and even the public radios take sides. They should not, because it's forbidden. They should be neutral. But they do the take sides. Trump. Sorry? That was the same as Trump. I mean, I say yeah, 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 true. Uh, most of the medias, most of the medias, but you had Fox News in America. Fox News was still quite important. Or, uh, but in France, I don't know of one... Okay, you have like three... Yeah. Like the four, the four main French newspapers are Le Figaro, Le Monde, Les Echos, it's uh, economic, and Libération, which is quite left. All for Macron. Okay? Um, the, uh, and, and, and people from Le Front National accuse Macron of being, because there is a big. Uh, um, a big businessman, French businessman called Drahi, who is Franco-Israeli and lives in Switzerland, which is good for taxes. Um, and he owns, and he, though he went to the best engineer school in France, which is called, called Ecole Polytechnique, but he lives in Switzerland. And he has also an Israeli passport. And he's also French and a French officer because he went to the French uh, Polytechnical School. Uh, and this uh, Drahi is the owner of Liberation, the owner of BFM, which is kind of a, of a French CNN, if you like. Yeah. And it happens that uh, uh, when Macron was advisor of Hollande in the Elysee, economical advisor, um, he gave this Drahi the uh, second um, he allowed him to buy the second uh, mobile phone network in France called SFR. But, but, but then again, if I put the question short, oh, it was about... Yeah. Sorry, but this is not quite an answer to my question. Yes. Yeah. That was why I was pointing yeah. to it again. The question was, with, with the 10% abstention, yeah. where does that go Thank in the you. second round? Sorry? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, it's not a 10% abstention. It's it was for the first one a 21% abstention. Um, will we have? Um, 
What is your question? We, we, I, I, cannot predict, I cannot predict the abstention. I, I just can't. Because it will depend also on the debate, which is on Wednesday. I cannot predict, uh, and I will not predict, anything in, in French politics. But um, if you tell me, uh, will we have 30% of abstention in the second round? I don't believe so. I can be wrong. I can be wrong. The abstention in the first one was 21%. And you think it will lower in the second round? No, probably it will be higher. Because, but, yeah. because a lot of people who... Uh, it can go to 30%, because a lot of people yeah. okay, could, yeah. uh, could, uh, could say, oh, I, I don't care, I don't want to, what, the one or the other. Or you can have people very interested in this TV debate on Wednesday, and they will go to vote. I have no idea. So tomorrow is a big day then. The, the last question. Um, yeah. Thank you for mentioning the banks. Um, I would, one thing that hasn't been spoken about is this evening is the, the périphérique, uh, the ville périphérique, uh, Paris, uh, Lyon, and all the social unrest and social problems that are confronted, uh, the inhabitants confront there. How do you see the elections playing out for these people? Because that's really where, it seems to me at least, where France has a huge problem that needs to be solved in the next five to seven years. There is a very famous sociologist called uh, Christophe Gelluy who wrote a book called La France Périphérique. The France that is forgotten by the medias, by the social services, that lives in the rural areas, um, in the suburbs, not in the big cities, small cities, small cities, uh, or small villages. And um, the forgotten of the mondialization, of the globalization. Um, these, these people, these people will vote uh, for Marine Le Pen. These people, the electorate of Marine Le Pen is in, in, in uh, for these people. I live in a chic district of Paris, you know. Um, nobody votes for Marine Le Pen. I, l I live in the sixth district. Uh, it's, it's, you have some right wing and you have some, a lot of what we call gauche caviar, <laughs> left caviar, you know? Do you know how you translate left caviar in England, in English from England? Champagne socialist. How do you translate gauche caviar in American? Limousine liberals, just a... <laughs> So anyway, in, in, yeah. in this, the limousine liberals or the, or the gauche caviar or the champagne socialist, they don't, they are, no. they, they are in the globalization, they will. But all, all the people that are just France périphérique, the small cities, but that, cities but, that you have never heard of, you know, yeah. uh, in, in, in maybe in Charleville-Mézières, you know, like near the Belgium border, for instance, these people will vote for Le Pen. But can Macron, and that's really the last question, and it's from me, um, be the one who bridges that social unrest, that social divide? We all hope so. I mean, he is young, is energetic, is knowledgeable. He has uh, maybe he has a colon vertebral, is a, a spine, a spine who is his wife, it is not said in, uh, in, in this report, with, which was a little bit politically correct in CNN. <coughs> he didn't just by chance marry a, a, a wife who was like 24 years older than him. No, when he was 16, he, he wanted, he had an affair with his French teacher, okay? French is quite important, uh, French teacher when you are 16. Um, uh, and because for some kind of academic reasons, and then uh, he 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 married her. She was she was already married, and she had three kids. So he married. He married his teacher. 
But yeah. how is that going to bridge the social <laughs> unrest? I don't know. That's the <laughs> my question. So she is. He said. He said. He said that she is the spine of his character and of his ah, life. Okay. Yeah. He said that. We don't know. The guy didn't have to. He was was not really in charge. Okay. We we can. He has never been elected. He has never been a mayor. He, he has He's never, never been held public office. What? Public office never. No, he was a minister, but as an advisor, you know, and he had yes, he, he was sharing actually the minister of economy and finance with some other guy. So we we don't know. He have the guts. Yeah. We don't know. I mean, it's uh, it's if he's ready to really to to go to crisis and to be tough and to not to yield to 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 to, to set a, a, a direction and not to change for it. Yeah. Why he didn't why he didn't make a program? He's smart because he knows that Fio made a program. He said, "Okay, I will not." Social security will not pay for your teeth, for instance. Or, uh, it was a little bit more complicated than that, but let's say. He said social security will pay only for your very serious disease, but will not pay, pay for your, your small disease. Everybody said, oh, Fion is bad, Fion is bad, Fion is bad. His, his, his rate, his, his, his polling rate uh, went down. So it, it's better not to have a program and then to do it, maybe to be unpopular, but after five years, to go to the electorate and to say, look, where France was when I took it, where France is now. Yeah. This is the only thing that he can do. We, or maybe, it will be very soft, like Hollande, doing nothing. Yeah. We don't but, know. But, it, but if I then summarize this, I mean, we didn't have, in that sense, an alarmist tone because you would say um, probably Macron is going to be the next president, so Le Pen will not win. Um, I'm not alarmist at all, no. no. But at the same time, you place quite a heavy burden on his shoulders because if he doesn't perform in the next five years, yes, there will be a big... Because we have waited so much, and it's why I explained everything with my five presidents, you know, yeah. that did nothing. Uh, I mean, the last homme d'état, how would you say that in English? Statement, statesman. Like yeah. Really statesman. The last statesman that we had, we left very good finance, who was a very good economist and tough, yeah. was Raymond Barr. He was a prime minister of Giscard uh, until uh, 81. But then he was a candidate in the 1988 election. I voted for him, but he scored third. He, he arrived third. You know, Mitterrand, Chirac yeah. went, went before him. So the French did a bad choice, according to me, uh, by not voting for Raymond Barr. But as we say in French, mort au con. Um, uh, we have the, in democracies, you have the governments that you deserve. Well, I think those are um, good uh, final words to top it off, Renaud. Um, so tomorrow is going to be... Alleen als je er echt niet van kan slapen als je het niet vraagt. Oké. Are the French ready to invest in France? Because you, you, you named Drahi, there is uh, uh, Arnaud, the, the, the moment he can um, start a factory somewhere where, where, where the labor is cheaper, that's not investing in France. We know Gérard Depardieu, when he can go to Russia, he goes to Russia. So are the French, with a good leader, prepared to invest in France? Do the French want to reform? I think it all depends not on just that. on the president, but, but on the people. Yeah. Okay. For the unions, I said that they wanted to make a, 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 a first of May defile. How many people there were? 30,000. And some, there were some youngsters who tried to break, you know, shops and so on. 
but, but there, there were not many, okay? S unions are not powerful like in Germany. Don't make a mistake. The government is afraid of them. It's different. They are not powerful. They are not representative. And in the, in the, in the last elections, by the way, the CGT scored less nationwide than for the first time since the Second World War than the CFDT, which is Reformist Syndicate, okay? So, uh, union. So this is, this is quite important. But if you are scared by anything, yes, you, 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 cannot, you, cannot, um, uh, you, you cannot move. Uh, the why French investors left France. French investors love France. But they left because you have a wealth tax that does not exist in Italy, that does not exist in England, that does not exist in Germany because the Constitution Court said it was against the Constitution to make a wealth tax in Germany. So you have no wealth tax in Germany, even with socialist governments, when they had Schroeder. You have no wealth tax in Germany. You have a big wealth tax of, in France. So probably France has to do something about it because the Italian government just take, took a measure. Do you know it? Are you interested? If, if you are very rich, like Arnaud or whoever, if you go to Italy, then it's night, you know, it's sunny and so on. You go to, go to Luca, for instance, or to Florence, and you are ready to pay 100,000 euros of taxes, enough, it's a forfait. Even if you have millions, but you have like French people who pay, who pays, I don't know, 30 million a year of taxes because of wealth tax, do you understand? But if I, again, I'm going to do it for the fourth time, I think, put it to a, a short yes or no question. Are the French ready to accept that reform has to be made? Yes, I, I think they are ready, but they need, as everywhere, they need a leader. Okay? Okay? Yes. <laughs> if, I, if you want, if you want, if you want, if you want, if you want an answer, you need a leader. Are yeah. Dutch paratroopers ready to fight for a just cause? I would say yes, and I've met them in, uh, in if Bosnia. They have a leader. But if they have a colonel who tells them, go and fight, shoot, which they didn't do in Srebrenica, just shoot, just do your fucking job of soldier, you know, okay. So Macron has to be the colonel of this new France. Exactly, the colonel, yes, the, yes, of course, the colonel of the state, because the French state is, is so fat. You have like, I mean, uh, we, we have 10% of national product points, more than Germany, yeah. for uh, ruling the states and the, and, and the regions and the departments. Why? Is... I mean, you go to Germany, I mean, you know, it's well managed, like France. I mean, yes, hospitals are good, like in France. Like, but in France, it's, it costs uh, like 10% more. Why? 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 So, yes, he has to be a very tough colonel of the French state, which is lazy, obese, and uh, which doesn't work. And we have also a, a problem that I think you don't have, when you have globalization and we are competing with people, with uh, nations working very, very much, we have decided, this is the Jospin government, to work only 35 hours a week, which is just totally crazy law. Yeah. But the right wing, which has no guts, could not, did not, Sarkozy did not have the guts to suppress it. Yeah. This is. This is the problem. If you like, you have, you have um, uh, the right in France. You don't have a real right like you had maybe in England or in, in, in the Netherlands. The right is mesmerized by the left. Mesmerized, hypnotizing, okay, mesmerized. Because, oh, when the right takes a decision, will the leftist 
newspaper say that still that I'm a good guy. I think we're going to have to ask you back because we've also run a bit into overtime and um, your analysis of the right being mesmerized deserves some more uh, <laughs> analysis, I would say. But for now, um, in five days, the elections. Tomorrow is the big debate. Um, and I would very much like to thank you for being here. Um, I, I would also like to thank Room for Discussion, who tomorrow will host Renaud Girard, or they're sitting there, at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, what time is it? Uh, at one o'clock, so if you want to hear more, also go there. And for now, um, well, give him a warm applause, and thank you for coming. <laughs> Renaud Girard. So I hope